the webinar. My name is Chris Herrick and I'm the SV SVP of PACE and will be your moderator for today's webinar. As we get ready to begin, there are just a couple housekeeping items that I would like to inform you of. First of all, this webinar is being recorded and all of your lines are on mute to avoid background noise, so we'll be taking questions at the end of today's presentation. If you have a question, please make sure to type it in the chat box in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, as you can see illustrated here on this screen. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today's panel. The first one that we have is David Kaminsky. And David is a partner at Carlson and Messer LLP in Los Angeles and specializes in the defense of banks, credit grantors, telemarketers, and collection agencies in all areas of financial services litigation. He is a recognized authority regarding consumer litigation statutes, including the FCRA, FDCPA, and TCPA, and he regularly gives presentations at leading industry trade organizations throughout the U.S. Next on our panel, we have Ryan Thurman, and Ryan is the Sales and Marketing Director with Contact Center Compliance with over 15 years of experience in the contact center industry. Ryan is recognized as a compliance industry expert with a focus on state and federal marketing and privacy regulations, including the TCPA, FTC, state and global compliance regulations. He also serves as the Regulatory Chair of the West Coast Chapter of PACE. Our third presenter is Mitchell Young, and Mitch is a senior director at Newstar, where he oversees the collections, financial services, call center, and data verticals. Mitch has been at Newstar for 11 years, helping companies leverage real-time identity data and analytic insights to improve operational efficiencies and manage risk and compliance. And last, but cer certainly not least, we have Jeff Mina. And Jeff leads the company's strategic direction and is also the primary architect of the Connect First platform. He has taken the product through four generations in a desire to develop the most feature-rich, highly scalable, fault-tolerant, and secure cloud-based contact center solution on the market. Jeff has over 15 years of experience in the cloud telecommunications space. The next thing that I would like to discuss is the agenda that we're going to be following today. So first up, we will have David talking about the TCPA update. Then Ryan will take over talking about TCPA data compliance um, tips. Then we will move into Mitch, and he will be discussing mitigating the risk of TCPA. And finally, Jeff will be discussing the TCPA safe mode. And if we have enough time we will be taking your questions as I stated before so please do write them in the chat portion of your screen. So now without further ado I'm going to head and turn it over to David to kick us off with the TCPA update. Hello everyone and thank you so much for attending our conference today. We have a lot to impart to you. We're going to go over briefly the um, the FCC rules and what they really mean and um, of course the compliance component of this because that is the most important for all of you out there. I think many of you have probably been on numerous lectures regarding the new rules and so you also already have a basic of understanding of how it works. So we're going to go through that pretty quickly but also try to talk about of course the um, compliance component and get into the weeds on that. Next. So um, we're going to be talking about dialers, consent, um, on-demand text, and text messages and our compliance strategies. But compliance strategies are also going to be discussed throughout this lecture and we're going to be interweaving it depending on the topic that we're, that we're at at the moment. Next. Okay, so as you know, uh, the FCC in 2015, just in June, and of course affirmed in July when they issued their order, they released their new declaratory ruling in response to all of those petitions requesting TCPA reform. And uh, look at TCPA reform and this whole issue of reform is not dead. I know many think it is because of this new FCC ruling, but it is not. There are coalitions right now working, some that I am on right now, 
that are working to work with Congress members to make change, and we believe that real change can be made. Yes, it's not going to happen tomorrow, but um, there are many issues in the works. As you all know, there are um, several um, appeals pending right now. Um, PACE has an appeal itself, and that is uh, pending with the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. Sirius Radio has filed an appeal to this FCC uh, ruling, and uh, so has the ACA International. So, and uh, the ACA International, I believe, filed in uh, uh, federal court in Washington. So you see how so many entities, we're going to strike from every angle that we can to try to either take this ruling down get get clarity and strike certain portions of it or to make change in the law via Congress. So please know that I, I look at things as the glass is half full. We have a we would we haven't even begun the battle yet. So very quickly, this ruling, the FCC says, look, we're gonna try to make rules that empower consumers, that protect consumers. That's what this entire rule is about. They forgot everybody else in the entire mix and they just focused on consumers even though they said they were going to make some changes uh, to businesses who had legitimate concerns such in the areas of reassign or wrong numbers which we'll talk about later again debt collection calls those are going to remain within the purview of the TCPA um, nothing is uh, really free from attack that's the problem every entity that basically uses dialing equipment Every entity, every market sector is uh, vulnerable. Next. Okay, so let's just really briefly go over the old law because when you get, well, rather the law, when you look at the law, then you get context of what the FCC has done with respect to their changes. So 1991, the old TCPA law basically said this. It's unlawful for anyone to make a call using your automatic telephone dialing systems or, or your artificial or pre-recorded messages to make a call to a, let's just say, a cell phone without prior express consent. So it is a call to a cell phone via an automatic telephone dialing system or via a pre-recorded message without prior express consent. Those are your triggers. Yes, there is this little component which talks about, and you'll see in B there on the um, sheet, it says, or any service for which the called party is charged for the call. That is up in the air right now because no one really knows what that is. Is that a call from to a VoIP phone? You know, what, what is that? Any other service for which the called party is charged for the call? We're going to try to maybe get into that later if we have time. Very quickly on landline calls, remember, if you're making a business call, non-telemarketing call, then there really is no potential liability for, for the artificial or pre-recorded informational call because you have the commercial call exemption. And the FCC and, and uh, many courts have already ruled that exemption is so broad, it pretty much covers any type of informational call so long as it is not including an unsolicited advertisement. And remember, the trigger for a landline, it's not calling with your dialer. It is only leaving a pre-recorded message, whereas on the cell phone side, you've got the calling via dialer and the leaving of the pre-recorded messages without consent, which is the potential trigger. Yes, you have the emergency call exception, but I can tell you for debt collection purposes, that is not the need to collect your debt right this minute. So... Um, very few, let's say, automatic outs under the TCPA. Next. So again, what's a dialer? Well, as you know, Congress already defined it, and they said it's um, basically it's any equipment, and that means everything that you're using, not just, quote, the dialing mechanism. It's everything that could be attached to it, everything that could be a part of it is what the FCC has said that can store or produce numbers using a random and sequential number generator and then having the ability to dial those numbers. And we're going to explain this in context with the next rule. Next. So the FCC, what do they do? Basically, they reaffirm the 2003 and 2008 FCC rulings and they say, look, we've already ruled on this issue. We are just going to clarify what we previously said. And we're going to tell you that basically, hey, all predictive dialers, 
yes, they fall into the purview of the TCPA because we don't care about that phrase in the law that said um, using a random and sequential number generator. They have sort of written that out. Are they allowed to do that under the law? No. But did they? Yes. They basically um, wrote that random and sequential out and they're saying, look, anything that can automatically dial, anything that has the ability to, de to dial without human intervention, that is your dialer. So that human intervention phrase is absolutely a key. Did the FCC tell us what would work or what would suffice? No. They said, and I'm sorry, they said every time that you're trying to decide or there's an issue about whether certain equipment has the requisite human intervention to suffice, it's going to have to take it on a case-by-case -case basis, which means if you're in a lawsuit, right, that means that if someone files a, a motion to say, hey, I'm not using a dialer, so please end this lawsuit, you know, rule that I don't have a dialer under the law, it's going to be a battle between the parties with experts, with arguments, with fights, and that's the way it's going to go. And the FCC has basically paved that route because they won't give a bright line rule as to what is human intervention. But they're at least mandating that your dialing system must have human intervention at a minimum in order to potentially qual not qualify as a dialer. But there's more to that. So the FCC said, okay, forgetting about those random and sequential number generators, we're going to say that your dialer, if you can dial from a set of lists, you can, you can upload or download a list of numbers to your dialing system, and if you could press a button, let that thing just rip and, and, and dial, you got a dialer. We don't care about any of the other issues, that's a dialer. Then they even said, if, they even said in part of their lecture, if you are dialing random and sequential numbers, not generating them, but dialing them, that could constitute potentially a dialer under the law. And they said, let's just say that you have a dialing system pretty capable right now to automatically dial. You just happen to be, you've turned that automatic dial function off and you are not using that function. They said, even if your equipment isn't presently used, quote, you know, for the automatic dial function, but has the capability in it. In other words, you could do it right now. You just have to flip the switch then they're saying that you would have a dialer under the law. Again, this does not include a phone that can speed dial. That distinction they have actually, they did in this order, and they made that back in 1992 as well. So they've been saying that for years. It does look like, quote, anything that could speed dial could be a dialer, but they're saying no. So this is important when you're thinking from compliance issues. Does the dialing system or the apparatus that you're using now as a workaround for the TCPA, does it basically operate when it does call because you have to have some type of automation of some kind in any dialing system, even if it can't do it on its own? But is that really more akin to a speed dialing? I know some companies have talked about a click to dial, but when the click to dial is launched, Right thereafter, the system that launches the call is literally no different than an old speed dial mechanism. And the question is, can that possibly get you around the um, dialer uh, argument and issue? Uh, maybe, maybe not. It depends all of your other components. There's so many layers to this as we're going to see. Let's go on to the next slide. So what we just have from this slide, and moving on, next slide, uh, what we have from that previous slide is that you've got to have human intervention as a, as a minimum and if you have a dialer right now that can automatically dial but you're just not using that function you're using the let's say the manual mode in your automatic dialer or the preview mode in your auto dialer the FCC says you still have a dialer this is also the second issue that's very important with respect to the dialers it's the capacity issue they said we're going to say that the capacity we're going to clarify it Capacity does not mean what you're doing at the moment. It's talking about, it's not just the current configuration, but what is that potential functionality? What can this dialer do? Um, yes, they are interpreting this phrase very broadly, but they said, look, we're not going to go crazy here. This doesn't mean that your rotary phone, even though, quote, it could be rigged up and reworked um, in some fashion by some IT expert, and turned into an auto dialer. Is that what we're talking about? Absolutely no. That's not the potential capacity. The potential capacity 
meaning it's not going to be in theory or theoretical. They're saying this, if you have a dialing system right now and you could, quote, make a modification and you can make a minor change, a software change, a flipping a switch, something like that, um, we may deem that that constitutes a dialer because it's such a minor modification and that, that what they do and they look to as the sample is a predictive dialer. Let's say you re-rigged your predictive dialer, you took out the dialing, automatic dialing capability so you could argue, hey, I am not using an automatic dialer because I took out that functionality. The, the, the FCC here is saying, if you can add that back, if it's just a software change, a modification, then I'm sorry, you have a dialer because you still have the potential functionality for that dialing system to dial automatically. And that's the problem. They suggested, the good thing is they suggested that a handset desk phone with speed dial, again, not a dialer. Yes, the old rotary phone is not a dialer, and it is ridiculous that they used a phrase that I don't think I've even heard in 30 years. So um, uh, that's where we are on that. But let's talk about that. So what does capacity sweep in? Does it sweep in everything? No, it doesn't. FCC made it clear we're not going crazy here. Certainly smartphones don't um, you know, fall, have the capacity of an auto dialer. They actually do under the court's definition. It's just that the FCC is saying we are not going to go that far. But if you think about it, the minute one of my friends sues me because I automatically dialed him via my, um, my cell phone and that lawsuit comes out, that's when you're going to start to see TCPA reform because then we've gone off the deep end. And it's going to take something dramatic or drastic like that to make the changes that we're seeking right now. Um, next. So um, it, it just, it's interesting here, and I don't want to belabor this, but the FCC throughout, this, um, throughout its new 215 ruling had three different ways of looking at what is an automatic telephone dialing system, and they contradict themselves. At one point, they said, you do need something that has the, has the capacity to store and produce and, using, and uses a random and sequential number generator. Then they said at another time, they said, look, um, you, it's the capacity to dial without human intervention. And then they said, a dialing equipment that has the capacity to store and produce and dial random and sequential numbers, not generate them. They're all over the place. I don't even think they know that they have so many inconsistencies within their own order. But the one thing we do know that is the overarching issue that did come out, the issue is going to be the capacity. Does your dialer have any capacity uh, to be constituted a automatic telephone dialing system, right? Can it dial from a list? Does it have the potential function to dial a list? And do you have human intervention? So you need human intervention plus a dialer that does not have the capacity um, to dial from a list on its own, as from, to dial random and sequential number gener numbers on its own. These are key, key issues for not having a dialer. So um, I think when you're looking at your dialer, you have to ask so several questions. Does your dialer store numbers? Can your dialer dial predictively? Um, can your dialer dial by, let's say, pulling from a database numbers and then dial on its own? Um, can it dial from a list of numbers just contained within the system? One of the things that they also said, can your dialer dial thousands of numbers in a short period of time? This has been um, an issue for the FCC because they said, look, dialing thousands of numbers, short period of time, they think it constitutes a, a, a threat to pro public safety because they think that pe companies are just randomly uploading random or sequential numbers that they're just pulling from whatever database of numbers and they're dialing uh, healthcare facilities, um, emergency entities, and the police, and therefore they're jamming up those emergency lines, potentially uh, causing a threat to public safety. No one is doing that today. I mean, I just can't imagine, and there's no one that I know that's doing that today, so that's just nonsense. That's not a premise for saying, quote, you're a dialer. But again, it's these, look at these issues for your dialer. Can it store? Can it dial predictively? Can it dial from pulling from a database and does it dial generally from lists of numbers? You know, you also have to look in the context of do you have, quote, the requisite human intervention? 
Does it absolutely need human intervention? That is a prerequisite. And do I have any capacity to auto dial and to do the things that I just mentioned? Those are some of your compliance points in looking at your dialer and looking at your dialer solutions. Um, okay, moving on. Okay, so um, some companies have tried to get around the FCC dialer law by saying, well, wait a second. I store the numbers, but company X dials them. So those are really two separate systems, and they're not, they don't really coexist in any way, so I don't have a dialer. The, the FCC is basically saying, look, if the numbers come from one point but are, are being dialed by another entity, you still have a dialer. That, that separation um, doesn't uh, take you out of the purview of a, of a dialer under the TCPA. And they're basically saying, look, if the combination of those two separate operations basically gives you the dialing capability and part of it is automatic, then you have a dialer. Next. So um, an another issue here. Um, let's, let's talk about uh, called party. Uh, this is, was a big issue, but I, I don't think it is for most of you because most of you who have been working because of previous case law that has come out and defined who the called party is, I think you've been all working on the premise that most of you that, number one, the called party is the subscriber, the person who's actually subscribing to that particular telephone with that particular telephone carrier. The FCC is also saying now that it's a non-subscriber, and many courts had said that even before this rule had come out. It's going to be the customary user, someone who regularly uses that telephone, someone who's part of a business calling plan. Yes, that's not fair, but unfortunately that's what the courts are saying. Those people have standing and the right to bring a TCPA claim. So the subscriber could, or the customary user or the regular user of that particular telephone. And, and, the, and the FCC is saying, look, the word called party is those people. It's not the person who you were trying to reach Sorry, that has been tried and tr tested, as we have said, and they're not buying the intended recipient theory. They're saying the word called party, it's in the TCPA, and it's just defined very simply. It's got to be the person who is the subscriber and the non-subscriber regular user. And those are the type of persons that they can grant consent in, only those persons. Next. So, um, look. The um, FCC has said this, and this is a good thing for industry. You know, getting consent, and, and, and we're going to talk about capturing that consent, but get, get, getting consent is such a critical issue, and that's really your key to avoiding so many problems. I mean, con consent really is the mother load. So um, the FCC said this, and this is a good thing. You can get consent in basically any way. You can get it in writing. You can get it orally. There's so many different ways to do it. Um, so we're not going to pigeonhole you to get it in a certain way. Just get it, capture it, document it so you can prove it. And that's another compliance point that is so critical. It's not just, yeah, oh, yeah, we got consent. We got it on the phone somehow. It's the documentation of that. How do you prove that? Okay. And basically, the FCC said years ago, if someone gives you their number and they knowingly release it, They've given, quote, their permission to be called at that number absent instructions to the contrary. So someone puts on, a, um, on an application, a loan application, a, um, a, a sales receipt, and they give their number. They are saying that I know that I'm going to be called via automatic telephone dialing equipment or pre-recorded messages because the FCC has said that. They said just the mere giving of the number is enough. Yes, the FCC is also saying for compliance persons, if you really want to be clean, especially in your documentation, you're going to put that uh, in writing, and it's going to be very clear, and you're going to have an, a, a consent section, and you're also going to um, explain that we're going to call you via dialers, text messages, and leaving pre-recorded messages, because that's just the better way to do it. But they said the mere providing of a phone number on a credit card application for example, good to go. You've got express consent at that point to dial via your automatic telephone dialing equipment and to leave pre-recorded messages if someone hasn't said, don't ever call me on this phone or don't auto-dial me or don't leave pre-recorded messages, okay? 
Again, we all know this, a number in someone else's contact list, if someone gives you, quote, numbers that they got from a contact list, that doesn't mean that you have expressed consent to all those people. Uh, basically, you've got to get expressed consent from the horse's mouth. It's just the best and the only way to operate, especially in this climate. And the burden is going to be on us. It's going to be on the defense side. It's going to be on companies to prove that they had expressed consent, not some kind of vague implied uh, consent. It's got to be expressed and it's got to be from the person's mouth or from them on an application. Something that indicates that they gave you the number directly. And that's key. The FCC said a while ago um, in a brief that they filed in a particular case, they said, look, the whole issue of consent, it's got to be uh, tailored narrowly. We're not going to look at this as some broad consent that you gave to do anything with information that you've gotten from a consumer. You have to look at the context, and this is an important compliance point, look at the context for which the number was given. In the context of, say, a credit card application, someone voluntarily puts a number on that application, they consent to be called because in the natural context of a credit card, you're going to, quote, use the credit card as a consumer and you're going to have then bills that you have to pay. So it is reasonable to expect calls via dialing equipment and pre-recorded messages once you voluntarily gave that number. Next. And I just want to step back for one second uh, when you're thinking about all this. When you're looking at, you know, um, numbers that you don't believe you have consent or you just don't know because you're never going to get the data to back it up, um, you know, look at how you're dialing that, let's say, unconsented cell phone. Are you using a, quote, any type of system that can still auto-dial? Even if you're using, quote, the manual mode, in a system that has the potential to auto dial or has the present capacity right now to auto dial. That is going to be a potential problem. I know there are dialers out there that do have a manual call function within a dialing system that can be used in, a, in an automatic mode. That is not going to be an end run around the FCC dialer definition. The FCC and many courts will likely find that that would constitute the use of a dialer, even though at the moment you uh, use that manual mode. Remember the key is capacity. Forget about what you did, what can your system do, and that's the trigger. So here, again, consent, I already said it, it can be verbal in writing. You can get it on a website capture. Just make sure that your website has the right terms, conditions, check boxes, etc. Uh, placing your number on the loan app, the credit card app, conditions of admission on your patient intake, but very important for medical, those of you who may be involved in the collection of medical debt, those of you in the healthcare industry. Just because you have gotten someone number, someone's number voluntarily in the healthcare context is not going to mean automatically for every court within the U.S. that you, quote, have um, consent to call the auto-dialed equipment for, let's say, payment purposes, um, and several arguments have been made in various cases, the key is going to be your conditions of admissions and actually your terms and conditions to let that patient know that we're going to be t taking this information, we're going to be sharing it with, let's say, our business associates, uh, we're going to allow any other entity within our hospital facility to use that number for payment and um, uh, treatment purposes something to that effect so that there's that when that consumer signs that application there is absolutely no doubt what is the scope of that consent consent can be given directly to businesses they can be given to um, the person on a telephone company let's say credit card agent calls for payment certainly the person can say hey call me on this number it's the only number that i have you're calling me at a wrong number and again only get that consent from the consumer no one else. All you're doing is, quote, engendering a potential lawsuit. And you may be right at the end that the person who gave you the consent to call had the consent to give the consumer cell phone number, but you don't need to spend $50,000 to prove that. Next. So very quickly, um, let's talk revocation of consent. The FCC is saying this. 
this is their new rule. A caller can't basically limit the way in which someone can revoke consent to call. They're saying there is no restriction on someone trying to revoke the consent that they once gave. And they're saying that that revocation, you can do it in any reasonable mean, in any reasonable manner. They didn't say how, not even defined, but they did say that, that it could be done. So what they're saying there is it can be done in writing. It be, can be done in an email. It can be done, of course, orally over the phone as well. Um, they're allowing this revocation. And the FCC is, say, is basically stating this. We're not going to let the, the called party have to bear the burden of showing a, re a revocation. You're going to have to show that it was not done, uh, Mr. Company. That's what they're saying. And they're putting that burden, again, on industry, and they're going to focus that burden on industry. So again, it's all about documentation. You've got to look at the documentation you have. You've got to look at your terms and conditions. Does that mean if I have terms and conditions specifying a particular manner in which revocation can take place because now I've contracted with the other, with the consumer, right? I have a contract, I have agreement. Terms and conditions, um, are those conditions and terms that may say this is the way you can revoke consent? Is that going to be upheld in the face of the FCC's new rule? Because the FCC is saying, I don't care what you have in writing, a caller you can't limit the manner in which someone can revoke. That sounds ridiculous. How can you abrogate a, a contract? But some courts may even look at that contract and say, okay, I see that you have a restriction on revocation, but guess what? We deem as a court that that is not, quote, an essential term to this entire agreement, and therefore I'm not going to follow it. So that's another constraint, and this is the key. And this is the compliance takeaway. With revocation of consent, if someone calls you, if they write you in any manner, in any means, and they say, don't call my cell phone, don't ever call it again, don't call me with your dialers, don't leave pre-recorded messages, just don't ever call that person because that person is looking for a lawsuit. And if you call them one more time after they say that, maybe, that, maybe that's, quote, you, you won't have a particular problem because the person isn't going to sue, but when you call them over and over after they have said, do not call me on my cell phone, don't ever call me again, that's when you get that angry bird who runs to his attorney and starts a lawsuit. It's not worth it. Just block those phone numbers and have a protocol for compliance-wise to, uh, you know, to document that, make it easy for your agents, for your collectors, to document that revocation. It should be a keystroke because they have so many things to think about. It's just one more layer that they have to do. We need to make it easier. And once they hit that revocation key, it should be worked so that number can never ever be pulled and, and dialed via any automatic telephone dialing systems. Uh, and it's blocked forever. It's just not worth it. Move on to other matters. Again, porting numbers um, doesn't revoke consent. So let's just talk about it. So if I take my um, landline number, right, and I, and I take that landline number and I want to port it and change it forever to a cell phone, that's what porting is. There's a difference between for, porting, of course, and call forwarding. Call forwarding is just taking my landline number and forwarding it for the day, the hour, or permanently to my cell phone. That is not, um, that, that's call forwarding. That is not call porting. Porting transmutes and changes the number forever to a, from a wireline to a wireless line. So if you had someone's application, right, let's say credit card application, and they put down their landline number, the only number there, and then they port that number to um, a, a cell phone number, well, you have consent to call that cell phone because it is the same number, and you already had consent to call that number in the first place, and the number hasn't changed. So that's a, that's a good thing. Plus, all of your scrubs, compliance point here, all of your scrubs that you're doing with your um, cell phone identification programs, they are or should be incorporating the ported, um, the ported number list. And that ported number list is updated on a real-time basis. And I believe that if you have a good um, cell phone identification program, you are probably getting updates every single day. So that's a good thing. You're going to know what's ported. And that's important. 
Um, so second box, if you had prior express consent to call a wireless number and somehow that same wireless number is ported to another wireless number or another carrier, you have consent because you had that number. You had consent to call it. Third box, let's say if you have a landline number, that's being ported to a cell phone number, but you never had express consent to call the landline. Well, you're saying, gosh, I really didn't need express consent to leave those pre-recorded messages on the landline because I basically have the commercial call exemption because I am not marketing. So I'm good to go. Right, but when that, that landline number is then ported to a cell phone number, you then you don't have consent for anything because you, you never got consent to call the landline because the person, let's say, never put that on a credit card application, so you never really had consent to call it. You just have the commercial call exemption. So when it becomes a cell phone number, you don't have consent to call that cell phone. That's where your scrubbing um, um, technology is so important and absolutely necessary to identify uh, what's been recently ported and then to block those numbers until you obtain consent. Next. Remember with uh, landlines, landlines you could call all day and night with your dialers. You just can't leave pre-recorded messages unless you have prior express consent. But again, it's, if it's an informational call, even if you left a pre-recorded message without consent, you still have the benefit of the commercial call exemption. So again, revocation. Revocation, it's going to be the same for an informational call as, as a marketing call. There is going to be no difference. Again, your informational calls are your debt collection. They're your school closing. They're your airline notifications, anything that doesn't contain a solicited advertisement. Unfortunately, again, the, court, the FCC, once again, now it's been at least 12 or 13 years where they said the burden to prove consent is unfortunately on you businesses because you have the ability to do so. Why? you have the ability to maintain records. You know how to maintain business records. You know how to document everything. And again, for compliance endpoints, the documentation of, for consent is absolutely critical. And one thing I love, I, I've already said that, look, you can obtain consent. Um, you can obtain consent uh, via, um, via uh, uh, orally someone can call you on the phone and say here is my number please call me please only call me at this number that's consent but when they tried to say oh no i never gave you consent it is going to be your burden as the company to prove that and what is your evidence to back it up um if the someone on the, if you're merely saying well um they called in on this day and we documented and we updated the number and we documented the whole thing is that going to be enough to carry the day uh, with someone saying, I never gave you permission, maybe, maybe not. You don't want to get into that. I always say record those calls because the recording is the window to the world. It's your proof. And the recordings save companies more than they hurt companies. Yes, once in a while you're going to get that one-off situation, but that's the one-off situation if you have a compliance protocol in place that, that actually talks about the particular issue and capturing consent and you have that in your your protocols your policies and procedures but then the proof of it is going to be the recording and recordings for my purposes and when I'm litigating cases that has been the window to the world and that has been my quote key to proof otherwise you're in a swearing match for everything and you don't want to be in that situation you need to document everything as a company, and for oral matters, recording is the key. And don't keep those recordings for 90 days. That's not going to do you any good, especially when you have a statute of limitations in most states for the TCPA for four years. So be thinking about that because that's absolutely critical. And I see we're, we're sort of getting running out of time, so I've got to move very quickly here. Um, next. Okay, we're going to talk about reassigned numbers, and this is those wrong numbers that you call by accident, and this is absolute craziness, and this is actually Insanity 101 from the FCC, and, um, and here's why. So, again, the call parties, we already said, that's the current subscriber, it's a current non-subscriber. What they're saying on this reassigned wireless numbers, they're going to say this, 
we're going to give you one free pass, all of industry. We're going to say that you have one attempt to call a number after it's been reassigned. And let's talk about what reassigned is. Reassigned is that someone um, someone uh, has a number, you had that number with consent, they put it on an application, but unbeknownst to you, that number has been reassigned to another person. You don't know. What the FCC is saying is once that number is reassigned, you have one attempt to make that call to determine if that number is reassigned. And they're saying that one free assigned is even if the person did not pick up the telephone and say, hi, you are calling the wrong person. I am not Jenny Smith, the person that you're looking for. So then you're on notice. They're saying one call means one call. So let's just say January 1st, you get consent to call a particular number. It's on an application. And 60 days later, that, num that number has been reassigned to another person. You're likely not going to know that. They're saying that next call that you're making to whom you think is the person you're trying to reach on the phone may not be. If they don't pick up the phone, the FCC is basically saying, sorry, guess what? That means you have constructive knowledge that this number is be reassigned. Even though you never got a person on a phone and even though nothing or no one has told you that it's been reassigned or it's no longer the person's number that you were trying to reach. Yeah, that is crazy. But there are some compliance points that we can work around to um, uh, try to get from under this crazy rule because that one free that one free call let's say that that isn't a free call that's a nothing the only place that helps you this is in a case that I have right now which is a TCPA class action where literally we did call a reassigned number and we did call it only one time via uh, potentially dialing equipment so that's this is a great rule for that situation because the person actually answered the phone and said I am not so-and-so, you are reaching the wrong person, do not ever call me again. Well, I got at that point actual notice that it wasn't the right number. And we did the right thing. We did the right thing and we blocked it forever. So, that, but that's, that's not going to be the normal situation. You're likely not going to call a reassigned number that you don't even know is reassigned one time after it's been reassigned and somehow you're going to magically know that, okay, this number must be re reassigned because I didn't reach the person. So um, it, it is an insane rule, but let's talk about the compliance standpoints. Next. Um, so look, um, let's, first of all, there's not going to be a bad faith defense. So let's see, you're calling that reassigned number, right? And you're calling it hundreds and hundreds of times. And that person is never picking up the phone to you and saying, I'm not that person. This is not the person you were intending to reach for whom you did have consent that you can document, but I'm not that person. Um, they said that basically consumers can rack up calls all day and all night. They don't have any duty to tell you or to pick up the phone and to tell you that you're um, calling a wrong number. And that's, that's nonsense in and of itself, but unfortunately that is what the FCC is saying. You know, the FCC, so let's talk about compliance. Um, next. The FCC is basically saying that there is um, compliance protocols to comply with this new rule. They're, they're saying, first of all, um, you want to, quote, ma make manual calls and dial them to confirm the identity. But I know what you're going to say to me on the phone. You're going to say, wait a minute. Um, why am I going to be calling manually when I already have um, – the consent from the person, I've got it in documentation, I can prove it, this is their number, that means I have consent to auto dial and to leave pre-recorded messages. What in the world is the person, uh, the purpose of getting that consent and getting it in writing if I can't use it? But that's the insanity of this new rule. Um, they said, look, if you're getting a voicemail, listen to the name on the voicemail. Is it the person that you're intending to reach? If it is not, and you, that's the number you're calling, then you may want to be thinking about manually dialing that call until you absolutely know and you get that person on the phone. Uh, send an email to confirm that this is your telephone number and let me know if you have any update contact information. That's not always very practical, as we know for so many reasons, especially in the debt collection space. They're saying use a database tool because the various database tools such as Newstar, which is what the FCC actually mentioned in their rule, they said there's a company named Newstar and they can give you verification for TCPA products. Yes, the FCC also said, look, nothing is absolutely uh, 
fail safe here so you have to be very careful in what you're doing but at least they're mentioning that's a tool that could be used that could help you to get verification of whether the number you're calling is the person that you actually had consent from from inception um, they're saying look carriers we want your participation to make this type of option work and more effective well are the carriers going to do anything no are they going to put out a database that gives all industry or gives the public a um, a reassigned number database that's changed on a real-time basis, that's the only thing that makes sense in the light of this absurd rule. But so far, they haven't, they're not requiring the carriers to do that. Um, they also said this, which is the kicker. I love this one, and I'm sorry we have to move quickly, but the FCC said, hey, why don't you put in your contracts or your agreements or your terms and conditions that in the event that anyone changes their contact information, that they're under a contractual duty to update that immediately or to notify you. And they said if, you, if they don't do that, then guess what? You're not without recourse industry. You have legal remedies. So what they're telling you here is, hey, industry, go ahead and sue American consumers, your customers in some respects, sue them if, they, if you put that contractual provision in your agreements and the consumer doesn't follow that. That's insanity. But guess what? That's the FCC telling you to sue consumers. And I can guarantee you when that starts to happen, you're going to see the consumers screaming to the FCC about this issue. Because now all of a sudden, oh, great, you didn't update your information, you didn't tell me, and now I'm being sued by another, I'm going to bring a cross-complaint against you. So th that's how that's going to play out, and I can tell you, let's see how that works out for the FCC. Um, they're also saying, look, put an interactive opt-in mechanism in your pre-recorded calls that, so that you're giving someone the opportunity to press 1 if you are not Max Smith. That way your system can automatically, through the IVR, take that number out of your system, and you'll never call it again. Next. Look, there are many other um, compliance protocols. I want you to read this, um, this part of the, uh, the lecture. Um, we have to have, there's others that have to speak to, and we're willing to go a little past the hour if we need to. And we know you also have questions, but there's so much to impart. Um, so we're going to move on to the next slide. Um, just basically, look, old written telemarketing consent, you telemarketers who captured consent in writing, but not with all of the um, October 13, 2013 um, telemarketing rules that required that you, um, you have those seven points that you have to tell the consumer to, in order to capture written telemarketing consent. With the old telemarketing rules, if you, if you just got um, consent in writing, you were good to go. You didn't have to have all the seven points that the FCC required per their rule in October of 2013. But um, unfortunately, the FCC saying, sorry, telemarketing world, we are not going to grandfather in all of those old calls that you did have written consent for. You're going to have to capture written consent again under the new rules with all the protocols that the FCC mandates that you put in. Yes, this is absurd and this is incredibly difficult, but there are ways, um, there are ways to deal with it because we have no choice. We've got to. Next. So, you know, look, with regard to prior express written consent, um, there was a waiver, and that was 90 days after the release of the October 2013 rule, and that, um, that waiver still applies to petitioners as of July 10th. So, unfortunately, you only had a 90-day window after October 13th to capture this prior written express consent. So that's what you must do. You must follow that new rule, and the new rule is draconian, but it's got to be done in order to have that consent so you can then use your auto dialers to call um, those from whom you are telemarketing. Next. So um, on-demand text messages. So if you have those one-time text messages, that's right after a consumer um, request not to violate the TCPA and you're fulfilling their request and you're just confirming that you're going to do what they ask to do, that is fine and that does not violate um, the TCPA, okay? It's not telemarketing, but what you're saying, hey, I'm just, 
they said they didn't want to be texted anymore. I'm just saying, hi, I'm confirming that you do not want to be texted anymore. That's the fulfillment of a request. doesn't violate the, T the TCPA as long as you follow those conditions. The consumer has to request. You can only give one text in response, and it's only one. It's got to be sent immediately, and I think that uh, rule is actually within five to seven, I think it's five seconds after the initial text is received from the consumer, and it can, can't contain any solicited advertisement. Next. Text messages, internet to phone technology, very quickly. Um, if you're using internet to phone technology of any kind to send a text message, the FCC is saying that's going to probably look like a dialer to us. And we're going to probably deem that to be automatic telephone dialing system when you are making text using that equipment. Next. So um, very quickly and um, we're really running out of time, and I've got to go through this. You know, I'm sorry. I have to pass this on to the next speaker because they've got so many things to tell you, but there are so many protocols and compliance issues in this. And other than what we already talked about in this lecture, please read the next series of slides um, on this whole compliance protocol so you will, um, you'll, you'll see what are the types of things we should be doing to try to comply with the new rules. And talking to your legal counsel to get legal advice to talk about whether you are using a dialer. Are you capturing consent? Look at all your protocols, your procedures. Have them documented. Have them clear to show that you actually have a business practice to comply in detail with the TCPA because that could even help mitigate um, class action uh, potential liability. Thank you. We'll pass it on to our next speaker. Okay, everyone, we are running a little long. Um, there were a lot of things that we needed to cover. I will let you know that we're not going to be able to get to our Q&A today, but we will take all the questions and, that you posed so far in the chat box and we will send them to everyone via email. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over now to Ryan Thurman and he is going to be discussing TCPA data compliance tips from an industry veteran, which is himself. Go ahead, Ryan. Hi, Christine. Thanks everyone for joining today. Um, appreciate David the insight on all the new TCPA rules. It's really stirred up, you know, the kind of compliance and wanted to bring in some tips, just some kind of things that uh, you can actually use day to day and some of the things that people overlook when it comes to compliance that we get the kind of the myths and the legends um, in terms of uh, our experience in dealing with TCPA and cell phone data and so uh, I'm going to go to the next slide. I'm just going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> what it is that you need to do and when it, in terms of um, Simply identifying cell phone numbers is not as easy as you would think, and there's a lot of misconceptions about what the data is and how you can comply with just that, that basic idea that most systems are going to be a dialer now, so you need to be able to identify which numbers are landlines or cell phones so that you can basically plan your campaigns. And so there's really uh, a couple different layers you have to go through. There's the a carrier list, which is available for several sources, including ourselves, and then there's Newstar. Newstar manages the ported numbers, and the interesting thing about the ports is there's almost 5 million of them now, of people that have gone and moved over strictly to cell phones, and you also have people that go back to landlines, so you have to look at both types of porting, um, but specifically the, the, the ports from landline to cell phone make it so that you almost have to scrub uh, real-time or daily to really get the latest because of the frequency of that data and how things can sit around. So a lot of people are surprised by that aspect and even the fact that the minimum rule requirement is uh, really around a 15-day period for rescrubbing your phone number. So what we've seen with the new TCPA is people want to scrub as often uh, as possible uh, just to protect themselves. Um, and now I would say, you know, most the most uh, the other thing that's really happened is most people are using a vendor. Um, whereas before, a lot of people try to do this kind of stuff yourself, which just seems kind of silly um, given the liability. Next slide. Um, so there's some interesting things to kind of um, 
you can do with TCPA. One of the things we came up with was a uh, litigator scrub earlier this year. So what we've actually done is identified numbers that are being used in these kind of litigation traps. So, uh, for example, the the guy Lemberg that made thirty forty million dollars against the industry, and him and a few other names that are pretty common have come up that are um, tracked, and we pulled to get we pulled together kind of an exclusive type of uh, service where we can. Uh, scrub and identify for those potential numbers. Numbers. So, like David said, locking those numbers out and making sure that you don't ever call these numbers. Well, this is kind of finding the ones you haven't run into yet. Um, and so, it's pretty it's been very helpful. And in addition to that, you want to look for a, uh, a way to identify VoIP numbers, um, at least to have something in, in practice because of um, the unknown nature of uh, TCPA. Uh, and then also when you're looking at doing wireless scrubs, the big question is, you know, when you use a provider, are they going to help you and if something goes bad? Do they help have a indemnification? And also with your uh, um, setup, do they need to be, if you're going through a vendor, they have to be a, a, a legitimate new star reseller, which um, you always want to make sure that that's in check. Um, Next slide. And then you always want to see if they can help you with um, other types of scrubs as well. Things that people are surprised with TCPA as far as um, other industries that do not call kind of left alone, um, business to business calls, political survey calls. Um, a lot of people think it's just big companies that are at risk for compliance fines. TCPA. The litigators are very active, and uh, they target all all shades of uh, the industry. And I'd say that almost every customer I've dealt with has dealt with some sort of litigation. And so there's um, also inbound calls that can be, you know, people think that well, I'm only doing inbound. I don't need to worry about the scrubbing or tracking for cell phones. If you're making callbacks from inbound calls um, that can result in like, hey, call me on my cell phone, please. Oh, I didn't give you consent. And then even though it was an inbound call initially. Um, the setup calls, uh, I've heard about it a lot. I've got clients that have used our litigator scrub to identify people on inbound basis because they have uh, been professionally uh, poached, basically. And then you've got um, State wireless rules, which is all where you get, there's a handful of states, I think there's five of them, where you can't even manually call a cell phone. And that catches a lot of people off guard um, in terms of just not overlooking the state rules. Uh, next slide. Uh, the other thing that you really want to do is you want to have some sort of relationship where your systems talk together, your dialer and your scrubber, your CRM, some sort of automation um, because of the nature of the data and how it changes in terms of uh, dealing with TCPA and um, scrubbing real time is always is, is really seems to be the trend. Um, and um, you really want to make sure, like when you're working with somebody, if they tell you on the myth that, that we hear is about the um, so and so takes care of it, it gets pre scrubbed by the data vendor, so and so, you always want to make sure that's true and audit and verify it, and especially with vendors or people that work underneath you. Um, there's a lot of uh, things that David didn't get into because we're short on time, but the whole idea around vicarious liability, where I mean, if, if you known or should have known, and so TCPA has got some real teeth in that area. Um, and um, I think that's uh, about as much as I wanted to cover. I want to give the, our folks over at New Star, Mitch Young, who's got some data, some information from their uh, TCPA mis uh, risk mitigation strategies that he was going to share with us. Thanks, Ryan. 
And uh, and I'll go quick. I appreciate we're at the top of the hour, and I know everybody's busy and probably has other meetings to jump to. I have four slides, and I'll try to go through it quickly and cover the types of data assets that Newstar has available. So um, uh, if you can go to the next slide. Um, so uh, the reason Newstar has been mentioned um, is because we, we really sit within the telco network. Everybody, you know, interacts with us every day, even though you may not know it. Um, and we help to manage identity within the telco industry. So some of the things that we do is we power about 70% of all the caller ID in the U.S. So we're actually getting subscriber data from the carriers. We manage that on a daily basis. So it's extremely accurate, extremely current. We manage directory assistance in the U.S. So every day we're putting out files of when landlines are connected and disconnected and uh, even when wireless phones get disconnected. Um, disconnected is different than reassignment, but it's still some core data that we have around when phones are, are changing providers. So we, we enable a lot of information within the telco industry, and it's one of the reasons why we've been mentioned a lot. Um, but I'll get into the meat of things if you switch to the next slide. Um, from our perspective, the keys to managing uh, TCPA risk in, in some markets like collections and others, there's a huge efficiency play too, is really looking at <clears throat> authoritative data, which is updated daily, to help solve three, um, three issues. One is, and the one we've heard the most about lately, is phone ownership and reassignment. So does your customer still own the phone that you believe they own or that they provided you and they signed up? So we have information that's very accurate and current that can determine who's linked to a particular phone number, whether that's landline or wireless. And that is one of the keys because all of the risk lies in dialing reassigned phone numbers. So some, uh, you get a phone number from a customer today and six months later they could have disconnected the phone number and that phone number gets reassigned to somebody else and you're dialing them as if it's still your customer. We've seen reassignments happen as quickly as 30 days after a phone's disconnected. Um, sometimes it can be 60, 90 days later. So best practices have been, and this depends on every company's risk tolerance, um, is to scrub phones every 30 days. Um, some companies are doing it 60 or a little longer, but we've seen reassignments happen within a 30-day period. So ownership and reassignment is, is a key piece to mitigating the risk of TCPA. Um, the second, and people have talked about it a lot, is phone type, which is, is it landline or is it wireless? Porting, honestly, porting is a minuscule part of the problem. There is a, you know, six, five million, six million phones that have been ported, and while it's very important, it's really a smaller part of the problem than the reassignment. Um, but what we do within our phone type code, we include whether or not a phone's been ported from landline to wireless, um, or whether it's VoIP. VoIP is another issue. There are many VoIP uh, phones that are perfectly fine. It's a Comcast VoIP, it's a paid subscription, and there's really no issues. There's some carriers that use VoIP where the caller's paying for that call, and they do provide issues. We're working on ways to provide some intel around VoIP, but um, still kind of in beta. The, the third piece is phone activity. So is a phone still active or not? It's not related to the TCPA regs, but it is related to efficiencies. And one of the things we're seeing is that companies, really this is managing your phone data for accuracy and currency. And when it comes to dialing a phone, a phone may not be reassigned, but it may be inactive. And there's little value in the test that we've shown in dialing phone numbers that are inactive. So the combination of these three elements um, is really um, what we have that satisfies some of the key issues posed with the TCPA regulations. Um, if we go to the next slide. And I'm talking fast because I know we're a little bit behind. So, um, so some of our tips, as I mentioned, all the risk lies in the reassigned phone numbers. And it's where inefficiency lies uh, in reassigned and inactive. So what we see are basically three steps. Identifying phone type, verifying ownership, and then repeating as necessary. And as necessary depends on what you do as a company. That could mean every 30 days. Um, that could mean every 60 days. It could mean every 90 days. But 
what we tend to see companies doing, or, or what's really important, is that there's a batch cleanse that happens right away. Because as these regs state, as the new guidelines state, this um, you're on the hook retroactively. So most companies need to do a scrub right away. We've tried to, for years, um, offer this service, but it's been very hard to get dollars provided to maintain uh, a phone list or a customer base because the ROI is not there. And really, uh, you know, cleansing the data and then managing it on an ongoing basis for shifts in phone type or for shifts in ownership is critical to help you mitigate your TCPA risk, but still maximize any efficiency you have in your dialing strategy. Um, the next slide, and this is the last one, is really just a look at you know, the data we provide back in the service. Um, and really, we can take in three pieces of information, a name, a phone number, and a date. And that date's related to the, a consent date. And then what we provide back are a few pieces of information. The most important is a verification code, which says, does this phone still belong to Bill Smith? Um, or does this person belong to someone other than Bill Smith, which is either verification or reassignment? We then provide codes of is the phone valid? Is the phone type wireless? This is inclusive of ports um, and up to, to the day ports. Uh, is the phone in service, prepaid, VoIP? And then a disconnected since consent. So one of the things we're able to do is say, has that phone number seen any disconnect um, since the day that you've got consent? So since January 1st, 2013, has that number been disconnected at all? So this is all information that can be provided back on um, a batch cleanse and then on some ongoing basis. Um, and then we'll work, we work with companies to help understand you know, different business rules or strategies that are relevant for them. Um, as others have stated, as the FCC stated, the data is not 100% um, coverage. So it is not a foolproof way of mitigating all your TCPA risks. There's lots of other things you still need to do, but it's certainly, um, as far as data goes, one of the most accurate and current and complete um, data assets that's really linked into the telecommunications community. So thank you for being with us today. And um, that, that covers um, the new star slides. All right, Jeff, last but certainly not least, let's turn it over to you. Oh, thanks, Chris. Um, first, I just want to thank David, Ryan, and Mitch. That was a, a tremendous amount of information that everyone has shared today. Um, hopefully, everybody's going to leave feeling a little better informed about risk and, uh, and your compliance requirements and responsibilities. Uh, you can go to the next slide. I just want to take a, a quick minute to talk about a uh, product that Connect First has had since uh, the TCPA refresh in 2013. We call it our TCPA Safe. Um, this is a 100% non-ATDS platform to help you uh, stay in compliance with TCPA while still contacting uh, the, the leads and people that you need to. You know, we've we've taken a great amount of effort to make sure that we are outside of the FCC's definition of an ATDS. Kind of touching on some of the main points that David spoke about. Cannot dial thousands of numbers concurrently. You can't potentially harm the telephone network and clog up uh, emergency service lines. All of the dialing requires human intervention. There is no switch that can be flipped. You can't just change dialing modes. Um, there's there's no ability to leave pre-recorded messages. Uh, we also have some of the the recording retention pieces. You know we can keep your recordings for up to four years to make sure that you always have uh, all of the proof that you need. Um, you know if if you ever did get into any legal conflict, uh, we've got a a full end-to-end -end audit system, which from you know, the actual human intervention that causes a phone number to be dialed on the, uh, the public telephone network all the way out to the carrier level, we can track uh, and prove that that was a human intervention initiated call and there was no automation. Uh, we have some consent management 
uh, as well as a, a full integration with DNC.com, uh, which Ryan spoke about a little bit. They are an authorized Newstar reseller. So all of our products integrate with DNC.com for your federal, state, local, cellular scrubbing. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of tools built into the Connect First platform to help you meet the technical requirements uh, to, to stay within the TCPA. Next slide. We've had our Safe Mode product reviewed by three of the, the largest uh, telecom law firms in the country. Uh, this is just a, a quote from Nick Whistler. And you know, we've we've really gone to great lengths to make sure that it's not just our interpretation of the TCPA and our our feeling that we're within the the letter of the law, but also we've had a lot of third-party expertise come in and try to poke holes in what we're doing here, and, and we have a, a tremendous amount of confidence that we have a true non-ATDS solution. Uh, so uh, that's uh, I, I appreciate everybody sticking around a little while extra today. Um, I think this was a, a fantastic webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. Again, everyone, because we've gone so far over, we're not going to have time to get to your questions, but the questions will be taken um, and we will answer as many as we can and get back to you. Um, a recording will be sent to everyone later this week and if you're wanting the slides as well, um, connect first and show